Okay. So we finished with the process of this. We discussed the CD4 cell function. And I just want to remind you so it makes more sense. That, you know, when CD4 cell is activated, a few things about that activation. First, activation happens when CD4 cell, right here, is recognized with, when it recognizes the antigen presented by MHC class 2. And then this activated CD4 cell can do several things. One, it can recognize that same exact antigen bound to MHC class 2, but on the B cell. Remember that both B cells and dendritic cells can express MHC class 2. So it recognizes the same antigen bound to B cell and basically stimulates the activation of that B cell. So it can efficiently produce antibodies, you know, differentiate into plasma cell or memory cell or produce antibodies. Another option is that it can stimulate activation of the macrophages. We mentioned before that macrophages are also antigen presenting cells. They also have MHC class 2. So that activated T cell right here will recognize that same antigen it's got activated against. Does that make sense? This time bound to MHC class 2 on the macrophage. And it will target that macrophage to that particular antigen. Let me give you an example. I'm kind of jumping ahead of a train, but it's worth giving an example. You know, TB test. So if you ever have been exposed to tuberculosis, you have a pool of memory CD4 cells, helper cells, that remember that exposure. So when you get this injection, this memory CD4 cells, they recognize the antigen bound to MHC class 2. They get activated. Okay, and then they recognize that same antigen that is bound to MHC class 2 in the local macrophages and they'll tell them, hey, here's the antigen, start destroying it. Macrophages start to destroy the antigen. At the same time, they destroy your own cells. You have a local inflammation and you have the little bubble at the point of injection if you ever had TB. Does that make sense? And the third option that I mentioned, T cells actively participate by release of regulatory <laughs> molecules in the activation of CD8 cells. Does that make sense? Now, so something that is not going to be on the exam, because I know that there's a lot of a lot of new stuff for you here. So something just as an example. So different infections they cause different profile of T-cell activation. You see here, T-cells are um, named as TH2 or TH1. Does that make sense? Or TH17. So depending on infection, your immune system may produce more TH1 or more TH2. For instance, TH1 helper cells the one that stimulate macrophages, they consider to be more pro-inflammatory. Does that make sense? Because they stimulate phagocytes. So they like stimulate inflammation really heavily. TH2 type will stimulate more antibodies. You see what I'm trying to say? So some infections will lead to more substantial inflammatory response, much less antibody production. Other infections will do the opposite. You see what I'm trying to say here? Now, we talked about Tregs, right? That they suppress immune response. Now I want to chat a little bit about the CD8 cells activation. So, this process will be looking really familiar for you. CD8 cells, the so-called naive cytotoxic lymphocyte, 
okay, recognizes the antigen, this circle in the center, that is bound to MHC class Y. Upon that recognition, cytotoxic lymphocyte gets activated, and then it binds to that same antigen bound to that same MHC class 1 protein but on the infected cell. So we had this example with markers when I was showing you, you know, like uh, if I'm a T cell and I see uh, a red marker, I'm presented with a red marker that is antigen by some dendritic cell, I know that if any other cell in the body <clears throat> carries this, carries this marker, I have to kill it. You see what I'm trying to say? And I go out there and kill. How, how do I kill? How do cytotoxic lymphocytes actually cause the toxicity? Um, two ways. Fast ligand, fast receptor interaction. So I'm not going to ask you where is what, because to be honest, when it's the dichotomous location, like one is on one, another is on another, I myself have an, has enormous trouble remembering it, especially when there is no mnemonic or something. So I can just, you can read. Fast receptor is on cytotoxic lymphocytes, fast ligand on other cells. I'm not going to ask you which one is on which. Don't worry about it. Okay? What I want you to understand is that there is a molecule on the cytotoxic lymphocyte, CTL, and corresponding interacting molecule on a cell. And if they interact with each other, if they form a pair that initiates apoptosis in the cell that is infected. Does that make sense to you? Like a magic wand, like uh, like a key, a special key that cytotoxic lymphocyte <laughs> can insert into the lock, turn the lock, and the cell will die. And the second mechanism is granzymes and perforins. You're already familiar with that mechanism from our conversation about natural killer cells or NK cells. So this image here illustrates it. You have cytotoxic lymphocyte to the right, infected cell to the left. Perforins are shown in yellow. They form pores in the membrane of the abnormal cell. And then blue granzymes, bless you, enter into the abnormal cell and cause apoptosis. Does that make sense? Does it look like rainbows and unicorns? It should, because the only question then, why do we still have tumors if cytotoxic lymphocytes are so awesome? If they can quickly recognize the tumor and kill it. Turns out it's a bit of a digression, but it's, I try to bring you basically the latest clinical development. It turns out that tumors, they produce so-called checkpoint molecules that basically are inhibitors of cytotoxic lymphocyte function on, you know, sort of a very primitive level of analogy, cytotoxic lymphocyte approaches the tumor, and tumor has a signal that tells the lymphocyte, I'm fine, don't kill me, you are inhibited. Tumors inhibit cytotoxic lymphocytes and evade the destruction. Does that make sense? So in mid nineties, James Allison, I know he's Allison. I'm not sure about James part from, he was in Texas. At that point, he already was at MD Anderson. He was working on autoimmune disease. He was trying to understand the very basic mechanisms of autoimmunity, like no clinical application whatsoever, zero. He wanted to see if he can use this inhibitors of 
CTLs to maybe in the future lower the incidence of autoimmunity or understand the mechanism for that matter. Eventually he discovered that there are inhibitors. Of these inhibitors, you can design a molecule that will bind to the inhibitor on the tumor and turn it off. So tumor becomes basically visible to cytotoxic lymphocytes. Do you understand what I'm saying? So tumors stop waving protective flags. Tumors stop inhibiting T cell responses. Well, guess what? He and a Japanese fella, whose name I, following the sacred tradition, do not remember, they got Nobel Prize last year for discovery of checkpoint inhibitors. But I believe Nobel Prize was a, a pretty penny, but compared to royalties that they got from the companies for the drugs that you, I believe, know as Optivo and Keytruda, they massively advertised on TV. So those two drugs are the most modern checkpoint inhibitors. They used to treat, have you heard about Jimmy Carter's melanoma? The aggressive, so Jimmy Carter got melanoma, got treated with one of, I think it was Keytruda, got treated, complete remission. So they are very effective against certain cancers, specifically melanoma, and Onsmon's small cell lung carcinoma. So they really help. Okay, it's amazing how good they are. Also, it is amazing that we still don't really understand in which patients they're going to work. Because there are situations when you have a patient that should be fine, and you give them drugs, and they just don't help. So we're still in the process of understanding what else regulates the efficiency of those drugs. Um, as usual, the price tag is astronomical. I don't remember how astronomical it is, but it's pretty high. Okay, but that's the that's the cutting edge. That's the most modern anti-cancer therapy that we've got so far. Okay. Now this is the summary of the immune system. My purpose here is to not to go over each and every bit again, but to show you the links between different components of the immune system. So we talked about physical and chemical barriers, right? So for the exam, you have to understand where and what you can find it. Um, I had a question from a student that was in doubt. And basically what students said is, well, that was she, and she said, well, I know that dermicidins, which are antibacterial proteins in the sweat, she said, I know the dermicidins in the vagina. She said, I have one. You know, what if people don't know? And I say, you know, if you are in the AP2 and you still don't know that vagina is not a cutaneous membrane, you should be here. So I'm asking about general understanding. Know where you're going to find mucous membranes. Know where you're going to find acidic pH, basically, vagina and, and uh, stomach. Know where you're going to find microbiome. Know where you're going to find cilia, mainly respiratory tract. Does that make sense? Innate immunity. So here it is. For innate immunity, we've got inflammation, we've got phagocytosis, complement and interference. Know the mechanisms, what they do, how they activate it. And then we have adaptive responses. And here are the links. So humoral responses that lead to the production of antibodies are tightly linked to the innate system via the process of phagocytosis, right? If microorganism is recognized by antibodies that surrounding of microorganism with antibodies, what we call them, Opsonization stimulates fibrocytic activity. You see what I'm trying to say? It also activates complement on top of it. So that's the link between humoral and, uh, and, and innate. And then for cellular immunity, we've got T cells, right? 
the cytotoxic ones that are pretty straightforward. And you've got helper cells. And here's another link. Helper cells establish the link between cellular and humoral <coughs> by increasing B cell activation. They also establish the link between cellular and innate by activating macrophages. So it kind of gives you a bigger picture of an immune system. You see what I'm trying to say? It gives you an idea what, how different parts of the immune system, how different branches of it interact. Any questions? Vaccines. Okay. Serious stuff first. Types. So there is a lot of information here. Now, up front, if I give you a type Okay, you need to be able to match a type and the concept. Does that make sense? That's 100%, you must know that. You must understand the very basic advantages and disadvantages, and I promise that I will not ask about anything too deep that requires like professional knowledge of the vaccine manufacturing process. Am I clear? So let's talk about them. Inactivated vaccines. You have a pathogen like a virus or a bacteria or a protozoan and you inactivate it. Very common method is to treat it with formalin and then remove formalin from the final preparation. Utilize any kind of radiation. For instance, um, the experimental vaccine against malaria is malarial plasmodium that is blasted with gamma radiation. Okay, it's all dead and it elicits about 25 to 30 percent protection, which for malaria is awesome, better than nothing. Advantages these vaccines are safe, seriously, safe because. They undergo a very rigorous process of checking whether there is any infectious virus left or bacteria. They check it. There was a, a, a cutter incident in 1960s when this process was kind of circumvented. When the infectious virus was still detected in the polio vaccine and Jonas Salk said, ah, it's an artifact. The vaccine was used in a bunch of kids. And a bunch of kids got actual polio. A bunch of people went to jail, got fined and whatnot. So since then, if there is an infectious virus, you throw away the batch, you start over. Does that make sense? Um, easy to manufacture. Well, more or less, yes. Easy because, you know, you just mix your pathogen with an activating agent, let it sit for a couple of days, and then the rest is chemistry. Um, disadvantages, usually not the natural route of infection. So say uh, when you get flu vaccine, inactivated flu vaccine, it is injectable. Does that make sense? Flu is not transmitted by blood, it's a respiratory disease. So it's not a natural route and it will not produce the best combination of immune responses. As I mentioned, com incomplete inactivation. Theoretically possible. The only case that I know is the Carter incident. Uh, DT, DTAP, inactivated polio, the one that is given to kids in the United States. Flu. Typical flu, the injectable flu vaccine. Does that make sense? So far, we're good. Attenuated vaccines. Take a pathogen and you weak it, weaken it, so it, it's not causing the disease anymore. Um, called attenuated pathogen. Example uh, advantages: usually natural route of infection. There was a vaccine against flu called flu mist. Kids loved it because all it does you spray it in the nose. 
That's it. No injection, nothing. Um, disadvantage of that was really hard to dose properly because each spray delivered slightly different number of virus particles, so immune responses were all over the place. Now, in this case, the live vaccine, the attenuated vaccine, usually provides a better, more complete immune response because it mimics the natural route. Does that make sense to you? Um, disadvantage. Infection in immunocompromised individuals. Um, the one that I actually didn't put here, but the one that we really should praise, smallpox. You know that some folks in this room received that vaccine. It is still given to uh, anybody who is serving in the military. Smallpox was completely eradicated from the face of Earth. I believe in the last case was in 1979 in Ethiopia. Ballparkish. I mean, 79 AD, that time. Since then, smallpox is gone. Like, it's not anywhere except for two places. It's in Atlanta. I mean, it's probably not the worst thing that can happen to Atlanta, but it's in CDC. It's stored in CDC in Atlanta in a very secure facility. And it is stored in Kultsovna, Vosibirsk in Russia, like BSL 4 all kinds of safety and security things. And it's still a debate whether we should destroy the stocks, whether we shouldn't destroy the stocks. I think with the, with the current political situation, God forbid us from destroying the stocks. Because if Russians come up and say, we got rid of ours, what about you? I mean, or the other way around, we should never trust each other. It's just better to assume that we both have, okay, safer. And it's interesting to study. No, seriously, it's like, it's an interesting pathogen to study. Um, so that's inactivated vaccine, and there were cases, there was a famous case when this vaccine was given to an American serviceman who came home and had sex with his girlfriend and accidentally transmitted the vaccine because it's intracutaneous. So you basically get a scratch on the skin. So it's inoculated into the skin, it's on the surface. And you're not supposed to have a physical contact with anyone through a certain period of time. And he had and transferred it to the mucous membranes in the really gentle parts. And she basically had a, a kind of smallpox rash. If you ever saw it, it's pretty nasty there. She, she, didn't, she didn't have a like, real big infection, but it was still quite unpleasant. There was a case when a recruit received smallpox vaccine and died, but he never reported that he was immunosuppressed. He either had, huh? Wasn't that I don't know. I, I really don't. I know that. It, huh? I think that was like 2010. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, well, my understanding of recent last year ago. Well, yeah, it was. It was quite recently. It was like 2010. You're right. Yeah, um, but he never reported that he was pretty badly immunosuppressed, and it was too late. Actually, U.S. Army has two drugs against smallpox. The problem is that they cannot test it on humans because we have no smallpox, and we're not allowed to infect people with smallpox. So they were tested on several animals, and they seem to work. But hopefully, we will never be able to find out. Yes. Well, uh, no, no, no. Okay, that's a great question. Seriously, yes. Yes. If there is ever outbreak, um, it comes from these two places. The claims that uh, my personal take on... So, first of all, you can find the entire sequence. Okay. You can make a virus from scratch. There was a manuscript a year something ago when they took an entire sequence of cowpox or horsepox and just assembled it using chemical synthesis. They assembled the genome and then used that genome to express all the genes and actually got the full functional like monkeypox or whatever virus. So they were doing the proof of principle. 
So people started to yell, oh, holy crap, we have a bunch of terrorists. That's going to, they're going to make smallpox because all sequences are out there. That's true. The entire genome of smallpox is out there on the internet in public library of medicine. Well, it requires an immense amount of money to put a lab together. Okay. It requires a very, a bunch of very qualified individuals to work on it. Um, it's not something that you can do if you have three classes of the local school. Okay, let's put it this way. You really need very qualified people who can work in, in the lab, okay? Uh, and on top of that, you need some special equipment and reagents. And let's be honest, if somebody asks, somebody sends sort of an order from um, northern Pakistan um, to buy a DNA synthesizer, that's going to check so many boxes immediately. Yes. Me? Yeah. Like personally, me. In terms of your knowledge. No, of no, I'm not qualified. No, I'm not. No. Here's the thing. Science. So, so here's the thing. No, no, no. It's a great question, actually. Let me let me tell you something. Science is super specialized now. Extremely specialized. Does that make sense? So, uh, basically, like, I I have a driver's license. And I know if needed, I can get probably not in semi-trailer, but I can get in the big truck and move it from point A to point B with a minimal damage to the structures and people, okay? Going very, very slowly. I know I can do it. It's, you know, it's not that special. In science, if you would bring me to that lab that resynthesized some of the pox viruses, I would stay there and I, have, I would have no idea what to do with the equipment. DNA synthesizer, I don't know how to operate it. I mean, you can Google it, you can figure it out, but it'll take a lot of time and tweaking. You really need very specialized scientists that know exactly what they do. And um, there is a basically a saying in science. You know, when you publish a manuscript, you're supposed to publish your methods. And methods can be pretty detailed. And if you want to repeat what authors did, you never go to methods, you just call authors. Because it never works. There are a lot of tiny little tricks, like heat it to this temperature, or after you turn off the heat, keep it for 10 minutes, something like that, you know? Or, I don't know, do it on Monday morning facing south, you know, saying a prayer, something like that. So, all these things, they don't ever make it to methods, so. No, no, I I wouldn't be able to do that, and you really need special people. So, other examples of attenuated vaccines, MMR. Uh, interesting fact: the guy who developed this vaccine, Morris Hilleman, he isolated the virus that he later used as the mumps component from his daughter. Um, oral polio. So it is used in, um, it, it was used in Russia. It was actually the largest clinical trial, I believe, in the history of the world. When Albert Sabin developed attenuated vaccine in the States. But Jonas Salk vaccine, the one that you all had, was already in place. So there was no market. Sabin was a big friend with the Russian biologist uh, Mikhail Chumakov. So he went to him and said, basically, hey, Got a vaccine, want to try? Chumakov said, sure. And yet people in the higher, you know, government or, you know, parts, and they said, well, we've got a vaccine against Paul, it's going to be awesome. And there were, everything was at stake, not only careers, but for Chumakov, it was basically freedom because if vaccine wouldn't work, he would get in jail, but it worked. 
marvelously, side effects were very minimal. So they vaccinated like several million people the first trial. It's a pretty darn big clinical trial. Neil Wagner said, oh, we're going to keep going. So I believe I got that vaccine. You sometimes can see it on the old photographs when a child opens the mouth and the doctor uses a pipette to drop the vaccine. It's a natural route. It's an oral vaccine. Um, flu. Hmm? Mm -mm. Because we have IPV, inactivated polio. Ideally, what should have been done here in the States, we give inactivated polio that gives you a round of protection. And then you give the oral, the attenuated one. And it provides a really robust immunity. And this way, if you would implement this scheme of immunization on all, all over the world, and everybody would follow it, which is the hardest part, then you can eliminate polio entirely in a matter of several years. It will be eliminated eventually. Um, flu, flu mist, yellow fever, great vaccine, fantastic vaccine. Max Taylor passed yellow fever virus through mice like 12, 200 times. Got the vaccine. It's one of the safest vaccines ever with a, like two cases of side effects. Over 90 years of use, it was introduced in 1932. Uh, interestingly enough, now that vaccine, if that would be offered today, it would never pass FDA because of some side effects in mice. Um, subunit or recombinant. So you take a, a pathogen, you isolate a specific antigen from it, and you express just one antigen. Does that make sense? Just one protein, for instance. Super safe. Safest vaccines. Like, because it's just a protein, nothing else. You eat, pro you get proteins in your system every day, okay? Uh, immune response depends. Can be not optimal usually requires multiple <laughs> booster immunizations uh, expensive so two examples that we use now have B amazing vaccine so safe that it's given first day of life or third day of life something like that it is fantastically safe and papillomavirus which is also super safe okay um, chimeric or vector vaccines that's a pretty cool one. So you have a virus. Does that make sense? Virus that does not cause any human disease. And you rip certain parts of that virus out. And you introduce a gene that encodes your antigen of interest. So imagine you have a genome of yellow fever, the vaccine virus. Does that make sense? That 17D vaccine, 17D virus, that doesn't cause any human disease. And you take a part of that genome and you replace it with the genes from Japanese encephalitis virus. So now you have a chimera. You have a virus that is 70% yellow fever, 30% Japanese encephalitis. This virus cannot cause either of those diseases but gives you an immunity against at least one of those does that make sense and by basically replacing that antigen part it's really easy to make new vaccines there are some restrictions viruses usually have to be fairly close to each other taxonomically the most recent development is Ebola virus vaccine which was pretty pretty awesome when Ebola outbreak started in 1914, um, media was like running like crazy, yelling, why don't we have a vaccine against this thing? And a bunch of scientists actually had. But the problem is it's not, it's not a money market. So they had a lot of experimental preps, but they didn't test them because what's the point to run a clinical trial? And pharmaceutical companies didn't do that because you cannot sell it. There's no market for it. And when government market appeared, the government said, okay, give me a vaccine, we're gonna pay you for it. Pharmaceutical company said, sure, it was ready in six months. They run all the clinical trials, they said, that, there you go, that's a vaccine. 
And it's a chimeric vaccine. It's the virus called vesicular stomatitis virus with just a bowl of protein. Works. Fantastic. Okay. Um, DNA vaccines. Remember we talked about bacterial DNAs, the plasmids. Circular DNA that can be easily genetically manipulated. So it's really easy to incorporate the gene into the plasmid and then use this plasmid as a vaccine. So advantage is really both chimeric and DNA vaccines really easy to genetically manipulate. The main problem with the DNA is that the plasmid can be accidentally incorporated into human genome. And based on my knowledge, I worked with the DNA-based vaccines a little bit. It's not it may incorporate. It does incorporate. And this is why these vaccines are so effective. Imagine that you have a fragment of DNA that carries a gene. The gene produces an antigen that gives you a protective immunity. Does that make sense? Now, you take this DNA, stick it into the cell, and this DNA gets incorporated into the cell or chromosome. From now on, this cell will keep producing that antigen, multiplied by a number of cells, like in billions, and you have constant production of an antigen. So your immune response will be astronomically you know, great and, and high and robust. So WHO has a big problem with that, with incorporation part, because the concern is if it incorporates in the wrong place, then it may disrupt some oncogenes and lead to tumor growth. Does that make sense? Uh, unverified reports suggest that SARS vaccination that happened in China was done by DNA vaccine because Chinese government doesn't really care. They needed to curb the spread of the disease and they did. Okay. And, you know, it's, yeah, we'll talk about vaccines a little bit more. So I used to have a whole rant about the common anti-vaxxer arguments. I don't do it anymore, it's just useless. Um, so basically like what we need to think about vaccines, they're safer than the natural infections, okay? Does that make sense? They're safer. There was a Kentucky, recently some Kentucky congressman gave chicken pox to his five or six kids saying, oh, they're going to be fine. Well, they ended up fine, but what if one of them would die? And it can happen. Or uh, I, I want to ask him, were you at home with them when they were sick? Like, were you sitting at home with sick kids or you were at work? And somebody else was taking care of them. So it's kind of, you know, question of responsibility. And also, your kids are going to have shingles when they're 55. Oh, they will thank you for it. Yeah, they will definitely thank you for it. Um, also... Vaccines reduce the economic impact that infectious diseases have on the population, you know? When your child has, God forbid, mumps, you stay at home. You don't go to work. You don't earn money. The company that you work for lose money. Okay, there's pretty significant impact. And they are... Now there is an initiative that you can apply tort laws to people who do not vaccinate their children. You know what tort laws are? And somebody else inflicts the damage on you. Like, it's a, it's a civil law as far as I understand. It's not um, a criminal huh? law. Yeah, it's not a criminal lawsuit. So basically, uh, if, like, I was operating some unsafe part of equipment and it hurt me, I can sue the company. It's not... It's not a criminal, it's a civil lawsuit. So the idea is parents do not vaccinate their kids. Their kids get infected, transfer the infection to other kids. That's the ground for the tort lawsuit. The damage that is inflicted due to the negligence of other people, okay? And 
for instance, uh, there was a, and that's like a traffic law, you know, because you're not, you can drive 150 miles an hour on the highway, no problem. And if you kill yourself, nobody cares. The problem is that you can kill other people. That's why we have traffic laws. And that's why you have to follow so you don't kill somebody else in the back scenes. If you live in the forest and will never be in, you know, interacting with anybody else, sure, do whatever you want. But if you live in the society, you have to obey, you know, the safety net. And there was a case recently when, uh, during the measles outbreak in one of the Rockland County, I think, in New York, um, the court demanded every child to be vaccinated. And anti-vaxxers went in court and sued the state. And the judge said, no, 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 no. It's safety issue. If you don't want to vaccinate, your kids stay home. And that's it. So um, it's really like, it's really a lot of aspects that just, you know, things like this don't make sense to me. Like people just don't vaccinate. So people would, if they got for me to have something, <clears throat> I don't know, inflammatory bowel disease, you know, they will go to the hospital and they will get a treatment that has massive side effects. Okay, I, we just, uh, my kids have a friend who has IBD, they age, and poor fella goes to Rainbow Babies every month and gets injections, IVs of pretty bad immunosuppressants. And it's terrible. And then, oh, one in a million kids have a side effect from that vaccine. I'm not going to vaccinate my child. It's too many side effects. Come on, give me a fucking break. It's like a t Tylenol. You can kill yourself with Tylenol. Nobody tries to ban it. You know? So that's that's the problem. Right? Now, um, as medical professionals, you will talk... Oh, by the way, speaking of vaccination, in one of the counties... I believe it's the state of Washington or Oregon. They have an increase in measles vaccination by 500%. But the irony is, is that increase is due to the fact that kids in that county were not vaccinated in the first place. So anti-vaxxers caused measles outbreak, got scared, started to vaccinate their, kid, their kids. It's not like those people are stupid, just stupid, plainly stupid. Uh, now, you will have to deal with people who do not vaccinate. And there are two types of those people. One type, they genuinely just don't know, and you will have to explain it to them. And second type is hardcore, like flat earth type anti-vaxxers. Um, Ignore them. Just try to get rid of them. Okay. I, I don't even get into discussions with those people. It's pointless. Seriously pointless. And I get so angry in like 15 seconds that I, if, if it's face to face, I want to punch them in the face. If it's online, I use language that my mom told me never to use. <laughs> Only. So, yes. No, I don't want to punch that student in the face. Well, you sure go ahead. You can you can even tell you know I say hello. <laughs> but seriously, it it's now here's the deal. Like I had a conversation with one of my students, who was a hardcore libertarian, saying vaccines. He understands the importance and everything. He's vaccinated, but he was arguing that's a choice, and it's not. Like traffic, being traffic laws, well, it's technically a choice. But if you speed for more than 20 miles an hour in Texas, you go to jail and it's your choice. So the same story should be with vaccines. You choose not to vaccinate your child, you can be subject to a, a, a investigation, whether it's a civil or in case there is death involved, criminal. Oh, yeah. great story. Yeah. Did you see that? He went to court and they emancipated him. Yes. Just did so you, he could get vaccinated. Did you, see, did you see what the kid said on Reddit? He, he went for the advice on Reddit. And he started the statement, 
Hey Reddit, my parents are kind of dumb. That was great. That was just brilliant. So that second type is just lost cause, really. It's terrible. Um, maybe there is a little hope to convince them, since anti-vaxxers never use proper clinical trials. They always use um, that one of my friends kind of example, anecdotal evidence. Here's something to consider. Now, the word of warning, this is really disturbing. I'm trying to open it up. So that's the site that is called Families Fighting Flu. And that specific page has family stories of people who lost their kids to flu. Yeah, so those are anecdotal evidences. Those are real people who did not vaccinate their children against influenza. Not even a mandatory vaccine. And the kids died because of the flu. And that's the stories. Say so they really I, I couldn't I couldn't read it. Okay? Huh? It's actually the site that that is run by these families that lost their kids. This entire non profit is run by the people who lost their children due to the disease that is largely vaccine preventable. Okay. Um, second, that's for people who can think. That's the paper. It's the, um, it was 2013, so it's quite a few years ago. And that's the map. On the left, you can see the number of cases of measles. Okay? Does that make sense? And on the right, you can see the vaccine coverage. Now, on the right, the color choice is terrible, but the darker it is, the lower the coverage. They're like overlap. Okay? On top of that, those communities, but there's poor vaccine coverage, they do not vaccinate because they are Orthodox Jews. That's really Jewish exemption. Okay? And honestly, religious exemption in the United States should be gone. Like, totally gone. Because um, physicians agree that there is about 1% of kids that actually require a medical exemption. The total rate of vaccine exemption in the States in some places about 10, uh, some places up to 30%, on average 5 to 10%. Okay? So that should be totally gone. Finally, New York State and California, they adopted a policy that you cannot go to school without being vaccinated. If you don't want to get vaccinated, go to private school. I totally agree. 100%. Um, in Australia, they did even better. I really like the practicality. Uh, you lose your tax breaks if you don't vaccinate. Because it's the public health care the state-sponsored healthcare. If you don't vaccinate, you put an extra cost on the state budget. So, I mean, people vaccinate like crazy because they don't want to lose the tax breaks. And on top of that, the story about vaccines causing autism. You know that? Story about, what's his name? I forgot, never mind. Just really, I cannot remember from. Andrew Wakefield, Andrew Wakefield who completely fabricated the data, had massive conflict of interest, saying that vac um, vaccination against measles, <laughs> MMR vaccine, causes autism, and was totally disproven, lost his medical license. Now he lives in Austin, Texas, and preaches that vaccines still cause autism and has a huge fault. Anyway, there was a study done, even how vaccines cause autism, and on that website, you can find the results of that study. And <laughs> this is data. They studied more than a million children, okay? Whether vaccines cause autism or not, and found zero evidence. 
And you can also purchase this wonderful t-shirt, which I really like. Yeah. So I just think, you know, this, this conversation, this part, like the first paragraph shouldn't even exist. It should be just a table, what the vaccines are. Okay, this conversation should never happen. Now, we're going to talk about some um, immunological abnormalities. Either your immune system can either be super sensitive or not working properly. Does that make sense? So when it's super sensitive, it's called obviously hypersensitivity. Type 1 is immediate hypersensitivity or allergy. Okay. So here's what happens. Um, you've got an allergen right here, okay, that is processed by antigen-presenting cell. And it exposes the allergen, presents the allergen to T helper cell by MHC class 2. And this T helper cell stimulates the particular pool of B cells. Does that make sense so far? So this is what we call T cell dependent B cell activation. And these B cells start to produce antibodies called IgE. Well, they differentiate into plasma cells, let's be strict, differentiate into plasma cells. And plasma cells produce Ig. And these Ig bind to mast cells the histamine carrying cells in your connective tissue and that's it that's the first exposure nothing else happens and then you get exposed to that same antigen second time so that antigen allergen right allergen binds to your sensitized mast cells and causes the degranulation so histamine um, molecules are released in the circulation. So if it is local, like mast cells in your nose, you have allergic rhinitis. If it's in the skin, you get hives. If it's in the low respiratory tract, you have wheezing, asthma attack. If it's all over the body, you have anaphylactic shock. Okay? You have all histamine that is released from basophil uh, mast cells will lead to massive vasodilation, so you have circulatory shock. Um, it causes constriction of the bronchioles, you have asphyxia. Now, um, can we cure allergy? We obviously can treat, right? Antihistamines, steroids, can we cure? Yes. Conceptually, yes. It takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. Uh, milder allergies, like pollen, you can cure. It's called desensitization. Basically, what you do, you take a person who has, a, say, pollen allergy, and you expose this person over and over to very small doses of allergens, hoping to run out of the B cells that produce Ig. Okay? It may take up to two years. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is what you've done. Yeah. yeah. You basically desensitized yourself in a very cruel way. Yeah. 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 You know, I love cats and I'm allergic to them. And my wife always wanted a cat. And I told her, yeah, you can bring a cat in the house. And for two, three, four weeks, I don't know how long, I'm going to be miserable. Because you shouldn't take any antihistamines because they will prevent the response. They will, you know, basically suppress your immune system. You should let your immune system to interact with allergen the natural way. I told her, look, when I weigh in on whether I love cats so much, no, I'm not ready for it. And our kids is, one of my kids is really allergic to cats, like asthma allergic. So I said, I still want to have two. 
Hmm? So um, there was a study in terms of desensitization with the peanut allergy. And what they've done, they took kids with heavy peanut allergy and they exposed them to tiny, tiny little doses of the antigen. And they didn't cure it. But eventually, you know, like when you have a special table in the lunchroom in the school where kids with peanut allergy sit because nobody else brings like PBJs even near. So, yeah. So now these kids can sit at the same table with people who eat peanut butter sandwich. They still cannot eat peanuts, but at least they're not going to have an anaphylactic shock out of nowhere. That makes sense? So, yeah, and you can outgrow the allergy. Your allergy can just go away. Okay. What's crazy? So, my ex's stepdad, he was stung by a bee. He's dead now. But he was stung by a bee two years or three years ago mm -hmm. at the beginning of October. And he didn't have like an allergic reaction. So, then later that month, he was stung by a bee and he just died. Yeah, absolutely. He had no history of allergic reaction. The first. And the first exposure, the first bite, yeah. was what triggered that particular response. When he was stung first time, yeah. he he just had a pool of B cells at that moment that produced those specific antibodies that basically absolutely. Yeah, if he would never got bitten second time, yeah, he would be he totally would be fine. Because that's the granulation part here in the right corner, this one. That's what happens the second time. Okay. And that's where when all bad stuff happens. Yes? Wouldn't like those exposure for especially food and health? Say it again. Would like uh, ill exposure for food and health? Because like sometimes now, like don't touch my kid, don't like walk barefoot, don't do nothing, don't go out, don't sit in the grass. Don't... So that helps when they grow up, they you're absolutely right actually early exposure during pregnancy study in Israel found that women that ate peanut butter when they were pregnant their kids had 90% less chances to develop peanut butter allergy which makes perfect sense because when you expose a fetus potentially expose a fetus to whatever potential allergen it can be, you know, fetus takes it as a normal molecule, you know, it's a part of maternal circulation, it's in the blood, those, because it's not like, look, it's not a peanut that fl flows in, in the blood, it's some kind of a protein or a carbohydrate. So if those molecules are perceived to be normal, you build immune tolerance, yeah, absolutely right, yeah. You've got to do it early. You've got to get exposed early. That's why they say diapers good for kids when they're little, just because they get exposed yeah. so much. Their immune yeah. system becomes very strong. Let them, let them, let them eat dirt. <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah. I told you about hygiene hypothesis before. That's that. That's that. When I think about the conditions I grew up in playing, I should have been, I should have had diarrhea like every day of my life. Because we were out there taking stuff from dumpsters to build some kind of pretending enclosure. So, okay, hypersensitivity type 2 is what we talked about on Monday when we did the blood typing. So this one is mediated not by Ig, but IgG, immunoglobulin is G. So the typical example of type 2 hypersensitivity is transfusion reaction. You've already learned we have four blood types based on the type of the carbohydrate present on the surface. A, B, both, or none. And you see the antibodies, so-called agglutinins, in the plasma. They are opposite. So if you type A, you're going to have an type B. If you type B, you're going to have an type A. Does that make sense? And then if you, you know, mix them improperly, then you've got 
the toxicity. So for instance, if you accidentally transfer type A donor into type B recipient, type B recipient has anti-A antibodies. This anti-A antibodies will bind to the A type blood of the donor and will cause hemolysis. Um, hemolysis breakdown red blood cells will lead to hypoxia, anemia, kidney toxicity, vasculitis, and so on and so forth. I was actually saying because people were trying to transfuse blood for a lot of many years. And before Landsteiner, Carl Landsteiner in the early 20th century discovered the blood groups, um, there was a saying introduced by some other physician that for the blood, and people were trying to transfuse blood from anything, starting from like monkeys to humans, all animals basically. There was a saying that for blood transfusion you need three sheep, a doctor, a patient, and an actual sheep that will serve as a donor. Now, um, another interesting type of hypersensitivity is the rhesus conflict. And this is a great story, really. Uh, not, I mean, immunologically it makes sense, but the treatment, I love the treatment part. So imagine the situation when you have rhesus-negative mother and rhesus-positive child. By the way, rhesus, our age, is just another antigen that may or may not be found on the surface of the red blood cells. Does that make sense? So if it's found, person is Rh+, plus. if it's not, person is Rh-. minus. But there are no pre-existing antibodies. So for instance, I'm Rh+, plus. I don't have any antibodies to Rh. You, I don't know who, who's here is Rh negative, okay? But if you are Rh negative, you don't have those antibodies either. You will get them only if you receive Rh positive blood. Does that make sense? Only if your immune system will see that antigen. So when mother is Rh negative and fetus is Rh positive, they bloods, do they mix? No. Let's not isolate them completely. So there's no mixing of blood. But when the baby is delivered, okay, when baby is delivered, only upon the delivery, when placenta detaches, Baby's blood enters the mother's circulation. The red blood cells enter the circulation. And they have Rh+. Plus, and mother immune system says, uh-huh, unknown antigen. I'm going to make this green antibodies. Anti-Rh. But the baby's gone. Like, I mean, not gone, gone, but baby's born. Baby's not in the mom anymore. So first baby's safe, totally. And then mother has the second pregnancy. But this time, she has those immunoglobulins that, as you may remember, will cross the placenta, get into baby's blood, bind to the baby's red blood cells, and will start what is called hemolytic disease of newborns or erythroblastosis fetalis. Now imagine hemolysis, hypoxia, anemia, but in the fetus, that's inside of a mom, which makes it really hard to treat. It's treatable, but really hard. Exactly. And the mechanism of the Rogam shot is genius. So as the prevention of the rhesus conflict, mother, quite counterintuitively, receives antibodies against Rh antigen. You may say, what? So these antibodies, the ROGAM, anti-RH antibodies, okay, they do not cross the placenta, and that's important. They stay in the mother's circulation. Does that make sense? So they, they hear blue ones. When baby is born, and baby's blood enters mother circulation, those artificial antibodies immediately bind to baby's red blood cells and they block them. You see what I'm saying? They neutralize them. So when mother's immune system looks out, it doesn't see anything because all antigens are already bound 
to artificial antibodies. They aren't exposed. They cannot be recognized. That's pretty cool. So for RH conflict, every time I have a pregnancy, the woman has to receive the rogam shot. But as far as I know, if mother is RH negative, they'll just give it. They're not going to. Because nobody's going to poke a fetus to see if fetus is RH positive or RH negative. Nobody cares. Do? You do, it at birth? do? Mm -hmm. No, at birth. Oh, at birth. But I'm talking about, because you have to give it before, mm -hmm. and nobody's going to poke a fetus. So RH negative mother will just get rogue shot. Does that make sense? Huh? I don't know. Like, it was with my kid's 23, and I got it when he was, I was pregnant with him. So that, at least that far, I don't know. But okay. It just seems that it would pass to the Oh, yeah. Yeah. A lot of things, actually, yeah, we have, you know, and that's, that's, that decreased infant mortality, of course. And that's another argument against anti-vaxxers. So if you really want to return to 18th century, yeah. <laughs> well, go ahead, but, you know. But all, like, people say, oh, it was so natural back then. Sure thing. That's why people gave birth to 15 kids so three can make it. And you Yeah, something like that. You know that terrible joke <laughs> about anti-vaccinated child who cries at the age of three? You know why anti uh, not, not vaccinated child cried when he turned three? It's a midlife crisis. Um, now... Type 3 hypersensitivities. That is true autoimmune disorder. I mean, by true, I'm not saying that others are false, but it's like hardcore autoimmune. So, you have antibodies here. I, immunoglobulin G. And you see the antigen. Can you see the antigen? The little triangles. So, your antibodies recognize the antigen and they form what's called an immune complex. And this, this immune complex gets deposited in the basement membrane of the epithelial cells. You with me so far? Now, you may remember, it, I shouldn't have said epithelial cells, but it's kind of written there. But basement membrane is a layer that separates usually epithelium and connective tissue. So say your endothelial cells in your blood vessels, the apical side faces lumen of the blood vessel. So if this is, this is a blood vessel, those are endothelial cells, right? So endothelial cell. So that's apical side that faces the lumen. And this is basement membrane. Okay? So when basement membranes become destroyed, the endothelial cells practically start to fall off the integrity of epithelium gets disrupted. Now, when these immune complexes get deposited, um, a lot of bad things happen. Complement gets activated, inflammation occurs, and leukocytes like neutrophils and macrophages get recruited to the side of the inflammation. Does that make sense? So all this leads to massive inflammatory and destructive response in the various epithelial layers. If it's on the skin, you've got psoriasis. If it's in the endothelium, the symptom will be vasculitis and thrombosis. If it's in the joints, it's going to be arthritis. If it's in the kidneys, the uh, endothelium of glomerular capillaries will get destroyed, so you've got glomerular nephritis and kidney failure. The classic example, disease-wise, of Type 3 hypersensitivity is lupus, which is accompanied by kidney, heart, and vascular problems, okay? Elevated rates of thrombosis, endocarditis in the heart, and kidney problems. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis, a component of it, is type 3. Um, antibody, macrophages destroy synovial membranes. Does that make sense? So that's type 3. Now, type 4 is, so here it is exemplified by the poison ivy. Um, I honestly, I still have no idea how it looks like. Does it look like this? 
Okay. Maybe I've seen it. But I, I really, nobody ever pointed a poison ivy to me. So I'm still pretty naive about it. Okay. Plants should be edible or, or they shouldn't exist. So that's my take. Um, so when you get exposed to the poison ivy the first time, nothing happens. Because what, what actually occurs, some molecules serve as antigen from the poison ivy. They get recognized by the dendritic cell. The dendritic cell presents it to the T cell, usually T helper and both T helper and cytotoxic, and they form memory. But you don't develop any reaction whatsoever. And then you get exposed second time to the poison ivy. And this time, the helper cell and cytotoxic helper cell will stimulate the development and you know, differentiation of cytotoxic lymphocytes and their activation. It will stimulate macrophage activity, so you have classical cytotoxic response. And that cytotoxic response will lead to the inflammation, tissue disruption, you know, poison ivy reaction, right? Um, now, type 4 hypersensitivity is called delayed. The reason why it's called delayed, it takes quite a bit of time to get the memory helper cells to first proliferate and then to stimulate macrophage and CTL activity. Does that make sense? So it's kind of TB test is the same as that. And some of the diseases, so basically rheumatoid arthritis is type 3 and type 4. Multiple sclerosis, type 3, type 4, it's combined. So a lot of autoimmune diseases have both uh, antibody and T-cell component. Got it? Transplantation. Um, yes? So in the case of someone who just doesn't get poison ivy at all, mm -hmm. I mean, it means that immune system, for some reason, this antigen, isn't recognized. That's and that's normal. Because I can like break through the poison yeah. ivy and rub it on my yeah. skin and I'm fine, but I touch my arm for someone. Yeah. Your immune system your immune system doesn't recognize it at all. Which is pretty good. Why does it have found that if you rub your ivy and you put hand sanitizer and question? But technically like everything that's foreign to us, why are we not able to recognize it? That's a great question. Um, we don't. So first answer, we don't know the um, exact mechanisms, how we develop immune tolerance, and we don't develop allergic reactions. So I would provide several ones. First, when you grow up, as Amanda mentioned, when you grow up and you get exposed to a variety of antigens as your immune system is developing, that likely contributes to the tolerance I told you about hygiene hypothesis. Kids in developing countries don't have allergies. They play in the dirt. Like there's no, there's no hygiene there. They yeah, they do have a bunch of infectious diseases and parasitic and helminthic, but they have no allergies. Very little autoimmune disorders. Okay. Second speculation. It's probably a pretty good evolutionary component. Because think about this, if you will develop some terrible reaction to, I don't know, poison ivy or honey or something else, and you have a chance to die, 100 years ago there was no epinephrine, so you die. And that's a big genetic component, and people who are genetically more sensitive just die. Okay, But the exact mechanism, how the immune tolerance is regulated, we don't know. Okay, we don't really know how people grow out of the allergies. We don't know how people grow into the allergies. You see what I'm saying? Now, um, transplants. You need to know four types, you know. So we have self, autotransplantation. Usually it's a part of the skin, so-called autograft. Part of the skin, usually from the back, from the burn. Um, 
isograft. Now, isograft is strictly between identical, identical twins. And I always tell students, if you have an identical twin, when class is over, go home, you know, numb them, put them in a the basement, feed them well, that's going to be your organ donor. So they don't do it first, okay? That's the best organ donor you can, you can wish for. Because the most common type of transplantation is allograft. It says non-identical, but basically it's fraternal twins are considered immunologically different, non-identical. The MHC molecules are different. Does that make sense? So there can be a situation when a complete stranger will be better immunological match than a family member. It's totally possible. Also, if you ever decide to be altruistic and donate, being absolute, and donate your organ, paired organ, to an absolute stranger, remember, God gave us paired organs for a reason. They paired for a reason. If one kidney fails, you have another one, so think twice. No, seriously. That's, I quoted my friend who's a doctor, is a physician, and she said, you have two kidneys and two lungs for a reason. Don't give up one of them. Um, and then there's xenograft from animals to humans. Um, not a lot. Something that is not terribly vascularized, like cardiac valves or um, tendons and ligaments can be transplanted pretty successfully. There are some works to make animals, you know, genetically engineered animals that will be better tolerated by the human immune system. But my personal take, everybody needs to register as an organ donor. That's it. Because I don't need mine when I'm dead. You know. Now, uh, what are the main problems with the transplantation? With the transplantation of the solid organ. By solid organ, I mean kidney, liver, lung, heart, rejection. So what essentially happens, uh, you've got, say, graft, okay, uh, which contains antigen-presenting cells. And these antigen-presenting cells in the graft will present the antigen to the recipient T cell. And recipient T cell will say, aha, that's foreign. Make sense? We'll go out there and, you know start killing transplant or the same situation can be when recipient dendritic cell will present a part of the graft to its own T cell so basically um, your immune system in a nutshell your immune system specifically your adaptive immunity recognizes the graft as foreign and starts to destroy and the only way to treat it is immunosuppressants okay and this is why we closely match people based on what's called HLA profile, human lymphocyte antigen. Basically, MH, what kind of MHC people have. The closer your major histocompatibility complex proteins are, the better the match. Okay. There was a story when, uh, actually, it's mostly the donor that is matched to the recipient. Meaning that, you know, you can be on the list and if donor doesn't, and you can be on top, but if the donor doesn't match to you well, you're not going to get the organ because it's going to be a waste. You see what I'm saying? There was a case when organ was transported from, I think, Britain to States on the military plane because it was like perfect match, but only military plane could deliver it timely. Another problem in case of transplantation of bone marrow is graft versus host disease. So in this case, the situation is opposite. Imagine you have a patient with leukemia, and this patient undergoes the bone marrow transplant. You with me? So in order to put the new bone marrow in, what do you have to do with the old one? Kill it. So you kill the old bone marrow, you deprive the recipient of all blood cells for good. And then you transplant the new bone marrow, which starts to produce new blood cells, RBCs, megakaryocytes, 
and white blood cells. And these white blood cells, including T cells and B cells, they get out there, they look around, and they realize that the entire body is foreign. And they start to attack all the tissues. Does that make sense? So, again, for bone marrow transplantation, there is an immunosuppressive therapy. It's pretty successful now. Also, matching helps. So, you probably know people who underwent bone marrow transplant yourself. They, I mean, I, my wife used to work with a, with a guy in his, like, 20, he was, like, 25, who underwent bone marrow transplantation for leukemia. I mean, he took some precautions. He was really careful about respiratory diseases. He never ate, um, well, limited his exposure to public food. So he used to carry things with him because he wanted to be responsible for his own poisoning of something. Um, well, yeah, because you don't know what hygienic habits of a person who handles your food are. So that, but other than that, people live, you know, pretty long and good life. Now, finally, I wanted to talk about immunodeficiencies, and we're going to take a break. So, um, two main types, congenital and acquired. Um, congenital immunodeficiency, the person is born with it. Acquired, you have no problem in your child and then later in life you know there's a problem so we're going to deal with acquired first any type of immunosuppressive therapy like the one that we mentioned in relation to bone marrow transplant it's acquired immunodeficiency malnourishment and various infections mainly viral infections like hiv hiv is the textbook example right Oh, cancer. Cancer would be an acquired immune deficiency. I also give you an example here, measles. When people say that, oh, measles vaccination prevents only measles, they're wrong. Because measles is a pretty powerful immunosuppressant. The virus kills B cells. And your B cell titers do not, you know, replenish for another half a year. So there were several epidemiological studies showing that people who underwent measles were immunosuppressed for half a year after the infection resolved. And there were studies showing that measles vaccination prevented complications, secondary infections, infections that otherwise would happen in those six months. Does that make sense? Now, congenital. Um, Granulomatous disease is disease that affects phagocytes, neutrophils, and macrophages. Um, that's probably the only one really serious congenital disease that affects innate immunity. And it doesn't have, I mean, it's unpleasant, but compared to the adaptive deficiencies, it's rather benign. So deficiency in IgA production your mucosal immunity is gone. So infections of the respiratory and digestive tract where secretory immunoglobulin A is common. Uh, de George syndrome. Maturation of T cell is impaired. You don't have T cells. Let's put it this way, okay? In de George syndrome, you don't have functional T cells. <clears throat> A gamma globulinemia. Um, you don't have functional B cells and you have no antibodies. And the icing on the cake. Severe combined immunodeficiency. It is X linked condition, meaning that women are carriers and men are getting sick. Uh, the story of a boy in a bubble. So the skid here is shown in the suit that was designed by, by NASA. Um, there were two stories about boys in a bubble. One kid actually went on to live normal life. He received multiple blood transfusions as supportive treatment. 
basically transfer of T cells and uh, antibodies, passive transfer of immunity. And he died in early 30s, his age, due to the kidney failure. Because blood transfusion every time it's a kidney failure, a kidney damage. Does that make sense? And the second boy, that second story that I read about, boy received bone marrow transplant because that's actually what can technically cure it, right? People with actually severe combined immunodeficiency, they have genetic problem in the bone marrow. The bone marrow does not produce TNP cells. So he received bone marrow transplant from his sister, uh, which was the best match. His sister turned out had latent Epstein-Barr virus infection, which went rampant in completely immunosuppressed child and killed him in a matter of a couple of weeks. And the parents had two more kids after that. The second kid had the same condition and died at the age of six months, and the third boy was finally healthy. Because it's genetically, it's the lottery. It depends on which X chromosome will be inherited from a mother. And first two times, the wrong one was inherited, and the third time, the right one was inherited. So, now, regarding hypersensitivities, you need to know, match the hypersensitivity of the mechanism. Regarding the transplantation, know the difference between rejection and graft versus host. Rejection for solid transplant, graft versus host for bone marrow. Four types of transplantation. For, um, what's the word? Oh, immunodeficiencies. Telepart congenital and acquired. <laughs> okay. I give you a list and you tell me which one is congenital, which one is acquired. Am I clear? Okay. Let's do a break. <laughs>